Hi, everybody. I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, you can all now see uh, the front page, Flight Calls to Monitor Nocturnal Migration. And uh, we're a pretty small group, so I'm going to try to monitor the chat as best I can. And if you ask questions in real time, I'll do my best to, to pause. I kind of time this to be about 45 minutes, so there's ample time for questions at the end, but also for um, things that might pop up along the way. Um, and I can't start this project without mentioning uh, that a lot of this work was done by an undergraduate student, Cameron Tesher, uh, who wasn't able to join tonight, um, but he graduated in the spring and for the past year and a half has really spearheaded the, the gathering of the kind of data we'll talk about today, which is using audio recorders to, to hear the birds flying over and to make sense of that in terms of nocturnal migration. Um, and with that, let's jump in. So um, hopefully some of us have been lucky enough to be out sometime at night and maybe get a chance to hear some birds passing over. Um, one classic sound around Davis is something like this. Oh. oh, can you hear my sound? I realize I might need to reshare. Yes. You can hear it. Okay. So there, passing over is a flock of greater white fronted geese, uh, which are, uh, as it turns out, pretty common migrants, even late into the spring, um, that migrate largely at night. And actually, we'll, get, we'll probably be, it's probably only like two or three weeks before we start getting our first um, flock starting to show up, although the real bulk of the numbers is not going to be until later this fall. Um, so birds move at night. Uh, but let's back up a little bit and think about migration in general. So when people say migration, they're talking about um, any kind of sort of seasonal movements of that have some general patterns to them, like movements of whole groups of birds. And uh, the general understanding of migration, it can be across large geographical distances, like moving from high latitudes to low latitudes at different times of year, or it can be on smaller scales, moving to different food sources, moving up and down in elevation uh, along a mountain, depending on when flowers are um, appearing or when fruits are in season and things like that. Uh, but the general logic is that um, birds want to be in places uh, with lots of resources and they want to avoid stress. So sometimes that might mean going somewhere in the summer where there's lots of productivity. Uh, but leaving when it gets really cold and there's no longer a lot of food. So a lot of birds migrate. Um, this is just a still image from the amazing website BirdCast, um, which is maintained by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, where they do two things. They predict for the next couple nights how much migration you expect to have in your area. They do it across the whole US. Uh, I highly recommend checking it out. Um, and you can just Google BirdCast to find the site. And they also show you in real time, if you look in the middle of the night, they'll show you what the radar is picking up in terms of birds moving over. So you actually can detect flocks of birds just from the reflectivity, from um, waves bouncing off of them that are picked up by radar towers, which is pretty amazing and has been kind of turned into, turned into a science really in the last just few decades. Um, spearheaded by people at a few universities, uh, but really run now at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Here you can see pretty high intensity where it's lighter colors um, in some spots along the east. Yeah, the east is lucky. They're spoiled. They get lots and lots of birds migrating throughout a long season. We're not quite as lucky in the west. Um, we get more patchy periods of good nights, uh, but there's still some high intensity of migration in um, from Northern California up into the Northwest and parts of the interior West. Um, so birds migrate and a lot of them do it at night. So uh, when we say nocturnal migration, these are the birds that are moving in the middle of the night. Um, generally, this is about uh, birds moving in fall and spring, in our fall and spring, moving north to breed further north and then moving south again to avoid colder temperatures and lower food availability 
Uh, and so in, in our area, we have a big mix. We have some birds that arrive just to breed, um, but we have a lot of birds that migrate through that are breeding much further north. Um, and then in the wintertime, we have a big arrival of birds. A lot of them stay around us. A lot of water birds stay around us. Um, a lot of sparrows stay around us. A lot of the warblers end up moving further south. Um, and actually, the large majority of birds, um, globally, many billions of birds migrate nocturnally every year. Um, so ducks are nocturnal migrants, shorebirds are nocturnal migrants, and most songbirds too, like any kind of thrush, warblers, sparrows, tanagers, grosbeaks, all of these are nocturnal migrants. Um, there's actually only a small number of daytime or diurnal migrants, including hawks, swallows, swifts, hummingbirds, um, night hawks are mostly diurnal and a few others, but the majority of birds not migrate nocturnally. Um, and in that process, um, birds typically leave right around sunset. So in the daytime, they're feeding, they're doing their thing. Um, when the right time of year is around, there's some combination of temperature and light that triggers this restlessness, and they tend to migrate at night leaving right around sunset or within about two hours afterwards and landing typically before sunrise, often up to a few hours before sunrise, although some birds might continue and land in the early morning hours. Um, and maybe some of you have been lucky enough to be out at some point where you actually, um, the sun is starting to come up and you can feel some new birds coming in and landing in the trees coming from the sky, um, which is rare to encounter. Um, it happens on like really good, kind of not too windy nights where there's a good migration the night before. Um, so I say so many birds migrate at night, but this poses some obvious challenges, right? How do birds actually do this? How do they know where they're going? It's completely dark. They're just flying blind in the night, right? Well, they're not exactly flying blind. Um, there's a lot of different cues that birds use, and it turns out they um, they rely on a kind of a network of different information that they can use um, together. Some of the earliest information came from um, birds kept in cages uh, where they could see the night sky. And people observed that um, birds would restlessly try to move to the side of the cage, which is the direction they should be migrating. So for example, if this is some bird far north, it would be restlessly hanging at the south end of the cage as it saw the night sky, um, if this is a migratory bird. Uh, so from this, people started to realize that birds could orient using the patterns of the stars. And people even manipulated where the stars were in the sky. And sure enough, if you changed it by 180 degrees, birds would also be confused and try to go the other direction, um, helping people understand that the stars play a, play a role in how birds are able to navigate at night. Um, this weird looking contraption in the lower right um, is called an Emlyn funnel. So it wasn't so easy to study birds my, with this migratory restlessness um, if you had to sit there watching them all night. So um, this invention um, by these two researchers, um, two, two relatives, Emlyn and Emlyn, um, was to put an ink pad on the bottom of a funnel and then put this cone-shaped paper around the edges of this cage. And then you could see which direction the birds are trying to hop based on where they're leaving the ink patterns in the morning. And so it was a way to quantify this movement without people having to stay up watching the birds all night to get a sense of how much they were trying to orient in a particular direction. Uh, and so then a lot of work built on that to measure the way um, birds are trying to navigate based on caged birds, but looking at species that are you know, wild migratory species, for example, savanna sparrows or white crowned sparrows. Um, a lot of North American sparrows were used in many of these studies. Um, the bird in the lower left, this kind of sad looking um, taped up bird, this is a Eurasian robin, so it's not a North American species, um, but this is one of the species that was studied to understand Birds don't just use the sky. Even if they can't see the night sky, they can still orient in the right direction. And part of that has to do with magnetic cues. They can actually sense the Earth's magnetic field 
and use that to orient in the proper direction. Uh, and we were able to understand this in part by manipulating the magnetic field using magnets outside of a cage, and that would simultaneously trick the birds. So if you shifted where north was, uh, where the strongest field was by um, like 90 degrees, the birds would also shift where they're trying to go by 90 degrees. Um, this, these pictures are kind of funny. You might wonder why one eye is covered and one eye is not. People for a while, uh, they thought that maybe birds only needed to, birds actually need to keep their eyes open uh, to use the magnetic cues. And for a while, there was some debate over whether it was specifically something in the right side of the brain and the right eye that was relevant. Um, but this is actually from a study that proved that birds can do it with either eye open. So they were they, they showed that the previous study that had drawn this conclusion was not actually true. Um, and But birds do apparently, there's some interrelationship with the eyes because um, with no eyes open, birds do not use magnetic cues as well if both of their eyes are covered. Um, and then finally, people also observed that um, birds use um, cues of where the sun sets. So birds observe the position of the sun as it's setting, migratory birds, and then um, that helps determine the direction they're going to take off and fly that night. Uh, one reason why birds mostly leave after sunset. Uh, that might explain that interconnection. Um, and people have since experimented with manipulating that using mirrors to trick birds about the direction of sunset. And sure enough, you can trick the direction that they're going to fly as well by manipulating where they think the sun is setting. Um, these are not, this is not exhaustive. There are more cues that birds use. Um, and there's no single cue that's most relevant. Everything seems to matter. Um, but we know the stellar cues are pretty important. Clouds do make it harder for birds to migrate. They tend to migrate lower. Um, and there tends to be maybe more birds wandering off course in, in high cloudy weather. So a question I haven't answered is, um, why would it be good to migrate at night? Um, what thoughts do you have? I thought we could maybe take a moment to populate the chat um, of why do you think birds migrate at night rather than in the daytime? What are some potential benefits of migrating at night? We know it's hard because they can't see as well. Okay, I'll give us 10 more seconds. I see some, some responses starting to come in. So I see um, a lot of people are thinking about safety. Uh, and also, well, I just mentioned the stellar navigation using stars. Maybe that's um, such a useful way to navigate that just makes sense to do it at night. Um, yeah, and so I'll tell you a couple of the... Um, of the common explanations people have. Um, one of the most common is indeed safety, so predation. Uh, there aren't that many high-flying nocturnal predators, um, but in the daytime, birds are particularly vulnerable during migration when they're exhausted to um, predation from other birds like Cooper's hawks and Sharpshin hawks. Here, this is a Sharpshin hawk with a blue jay from the East Coast. Um, and um, so predation is one. Another one that might feel very relevant to us um, here in like the interior valleys of California is that temperatures at night are pretty stable and they're not sort of painfully high. Uh, as temperatures rise, the process of maintaining body temperature uh, is very both energetically and water expensive. For birds. So birds can end up wasting both calories and wasting a lot of their water just keeping themselves at a constant temperature. Uh, and so um, flying in the daytime can be very stressful. You know, a lot of birds are spending part of their time just managing temperature uh, on a hot day here, for example, in August in Fresno. Um, 
Um, and then one final one with energetics. Um, the air is generally stiller at night. Um, and you might think that's good or bad. Maybe wind is helpful in some ways, but um, it's still in particular in terms of air currents rising up or dropping down. That's something that happens a lot in the daytime as different parts of the earth are heated to different degrees. We generate updrafts and other places where air is being pulled down. Um, and this causes challenges to flight. Um, it's harder to fly when there's these kinds of vertically moving currents. Uh, and at night, things to be tends to be much more still. Um, the layers tend to be much more stable of air. Um, there still can be wind at night, but there's typically less wind at night. So I see there's one question about the stellar orientation studies. Um, so yeah, it's not that they, it's funny, you know, every study is kind of limited. They're not really looking at birds, blindfolded birds flying very far. Um, most of it has been done looking at the direction birds seem to want to move based on birds that are in small confined cages. So not actually situations where they can really fly far. Um, although there are kind of field-based studies as well, um, looking at um, when there are certain circumstances where the sky is harder to see, like certain kinds of cloud cover or storms, noticing the ways that birds consistently misnavigate. Um, but yeah, most of what we know in the nitty gritty details comes from these much smaller scale studies of birds in cages. Okay, so um, a little bit more about nocturnal migration. What determines when it's going to be a big night with lots of birds moving or not? Um, well, it turns out that clear days are a little bit better, um, but not for monitoring migration at night. So what I'm going to talk about is ways we can use the calls of birds. And birds don't actually call very much on clear days, and they might also tend to fly a bit higher. Um, it's actually easier to hear birds flying over um, when it's cloudier. Uh, in terms of temperature, uh, depends on the season. So in spring, warm afternoons and nights tend to trigger birds to be um, ready to move. In fall, it tends to be the cold nights, kind of signs that winter is coming. And then for wind, um, it's actually strong wind is never good, even if it's a tailwind. So even if a bird wants to go south, and there's a strong wind from the north that would push them. Um, it's hard for birds to fly with a strong tailwind because if the wind is strong enough, it can actually interfere with them kind of getting up to speed because it can interfere with the regular flow of air over their wings. So birds fly best uh, with a light tailwind, you know, something that's five to 15 miles an hour. Um, but when winds get kind of strong, it's actually hard for birds to fly well. So um, we all probably feel this already. The Central Valley is a real migration hotspot. Um, there was one st a study a few years ago that estimated something like 65 million land birds passing through each spring. Um, and it's a great place to study because, yeah, we're on the ground in a small number of places, but there's tons of birds moving over. Um, and this kind of nocturnal study can help complement the kinds of on the ground bird observations people are making. Uh, here, to give you a sense of this, this is going to be an animated map of where yellow warblers are across one whole year um, based on data from eBird. And first, we're going to see spring. Right now, this is uh, January 1st. These yellow warblers are concentrated largely in Central America. And we'll see what happens in spring. First, the birds are going to spread across, widely across North America. The whole thing is going to light up. The darker colors are higher numbers. But watch in the fall. Look at the Central Valley. I'm going to show you one more time. As you look at California and look at the Central Valley in California, look at the way it lights up in fall. It's kind of this last, latest, super high density area of yellow warblers. Here comes the fall migration. And there's the Central Valley. It's a really big movement, and you've probably seen tons of yellow warblers. Um, numbers are going to still be going up um, for the course of the next few weeks, at least, before they start to wind down, but they continue all the way into um, October. 
So um, what I want to do, what I want to do in this study um, with that Cameron and I worked on is track these nocturnal birds. So how can we do that? We can use the calls they make at night. So these are called flight calls. Flight calls are calls that birds make almost entirely in flight. They might sometimes make them um, when they land right after flying or right before they're about to take off to fly. Um, they tend to be very high in frequency, so sound very high to our ears. Uh, and they often sound very different from the calls that birds make while they're perched. So here's a blue gross beak. And this is a typical call, call they make on the ground, sometimes called like a pick call. A very sharp Um, that's not what their flight call sounds like at all. Here's the flight call of the blue gross beak. I'm going to play it. It's very short, so I'll play it a few times. It's very buzzy. Um, and uh, a lot of birds, even birds that have very sharp or interesting calls on the ground, will have some kind of very short and buzzy or very short and whistled flight call. Uh, and so it's fun, but you also have to learn a whole suite of new calls to try to figure this stuff out, um, some of which are better known than others. So some species, there's not a great set of pre-existing data of what the calls even um, sound like or what kind of variation there is in the flight calls. Um, why do birds do this kind of call? What's the point of this very specific kind of call made only in flight? Well, um, from what we know, we know that birds tend to call more um, when they're in groups. Uh, and it seems to be that birds that are in larger groups also can maintain better orientation as they go. So this flight calling might serve to help birds kind of know where the other birds are around them and kind of help them average out their, um, their, their target direction to help make sure they're navigating effectively in the direction they want to be going. Um, that's about what we know about flight calls. Um, birds seem to call more on, in, in better conditions, but they're easier to hear when they're lower to the ground. And so there's some, um, some contradictions there because cloudy days tend to bring them closer and be the best days to hear flight calls, even if there's not as many birds moving. Um, so um, nocturnal flight calls have been used for research for um, something like three decades, long before actually, more like over a century have, people have been doing some work noting nocturnal flight calls. Um, there are some real challenges to it because you're not actually seeing the birds and so you don't know how many of them are silently passing over versus calling, uh, but it still can provide some pretty useful information about the general magnitude of migration, especially if you compare sites with similar conditions on similar nights to get a sense of where exactly birds are moving and when throughout a season. Um, and it might be one of the best ways to, to note the migration of more secretive species. Um, for example, there are some uncommon but regular migrating sparrows through the Central Valley, birds like the grasshopper sparrow or vesper sparrow, um, or many rails like Virginia rail and Sora, uh, which are not always that easy to detect when you go out in the field in the morning. Um, but very regularly make flight calls and have very distinctive flight calls that you can identify um, from a recording. So um, these are some of the key useful things. And um, we set out to try to get a sense of just the baseline of what's moving um, near Davis, but also to contrast that along um, some different longitudes from east to west, comparing how many birds are moving um, in the Central Valley close to the Sacramento River versus towards the coast ranges um, where we have different habitats and different um, climates and pretty different phenology of when we might expect the optimal amount of food for birds, the optimal amount of uh, the optimal flowering time. Um, and historically, the Central Valley would have been a hyper productive floodplain with incredible food in spring for spring migrants. 
Um, when I moved to California, I moved to the coast. I lived initially um, in San Mateo County, at, just south of San Francisco. And I didn't even, the, it felt like spring migration didn't exist. There were so few birds that move along the coast in spring. Um, and moving to Davis was my first experience of like, whoa, there actually is great spring migration in California. You just have to be inland or maybe far enough south in the state. Um, so we had a few hypotheses with our study. Um, we wanted to detect nocturnal flight calls and we thought um, we'd see more as we go further towards the center of the valley and see fewer flight calls towards the coast ranges. We also thought we might see birds moving a bit earlier in the central valley because food sources would become available earlier. Temperatures would be higher earlier. Insects might emerge earlier. Um, so birds may have evolved to move through this area earlier, or there might be particular populations that move through here earlier. Um, and then finally, more in a more, explore more exploratory way, we thought maybe different species use um, different routes. So we thought maybe we'd find a different composition or different proportions of different species um, in the middle of the Central Valley versus the Coast Range. Um, so as this was a pilot study, we didn't know quite what we were going to find, uh, and we didn't know how hard it was going to be to identify the calls that we recorded. So we decided to focus initially on four species, all of which are fairly abundant, fairly widespread as migrants, um, and that have identifiable nocturnal flight calls. So they have a distinctive flight call, or NFC, that doesn't look quite like any other expected flight call in the area. So the four birds we picked are the Swainson's thrush, Wilson's warbler, yellow warbler, and Lazuli bunting. Let me introduce you a little bit to their flight calls, uh, which may be familiar and may not be for some of these species. So Swainson's thrushes, they sometimes make this call on the ground as well. Um, and sometimes people describe it as a little warp call. I'm going to play the flight call of a Swainson's thrush. This little peep. Um, people on the East Coast say it sounds like a spring peeper, a species of frog that's also quite vocal in the spring. Um, and here I'm representing it visually. This is called a spectrogram, and it's basically a freeform version of musical notation. Here, um, times on the x-axis as we move from left to right along this image. Um, and the y-axis is frequency. So frequency is our technical term for um, how high or low something is. Uh, you can use it almost interchangeably with pitch, like a high pitch or a low pitch, except um, pitch is what we perceive. So it's slightly different, but effectively the same. So that kind of peeping sound from the swings and thrust really looks like this. It's some, some rising and it's pretty long. It's about a fifth of a second, which for a flight call is pretty long. Um, a lot of them are only like 50 milliseconds, so pretty short, a 20th of a second. Next, I'll play a Wilson's Warbler. This one might sound less familiar. So Wilson's Warbler's flight calls, they don't sound quite like the choo sound that Wilson's Warblers make on the ground when they call. Um, here is their flight call shown in the spectrogram. Here, this is only about 75 milliseconds, so less than a tenth of a second, um, and it's more complicated. It has some rising parts and some dropping parts. Sometimes people say it looks sort of like um, one of the symbols people use on a circuit diagram, like a resistance symbol. I'm not an uh, electrical circuits guy, so I don't know if that rings true for people who do that. Uh, and it usually has multiple bands. So there's sort of two parallel versions of this same shape. Um, and that can lend a richness to sounds, depending on how loud these different um, bands are. Sometimes it can make a bird's call sound more nasal, more rich. And let's look quickly at yellow warbler. I'm going to play a yellow warbler flight call. So not much to it, right? A little high buzz. Um, on a spectrogram, again, it looks very different from the other ones we've seen. It looks like a little spring on its side, just a little up, down, up, down. Um, 
We call this modulated if the pitch or the frequency is going up and down rapidly. And yellow warblers consistently have something like three to four peaks only. So here's one. Um, sometimes we noticed actually, uh, we're still formalizing the data, um, but we noticed that later in the season, more of the yellow warbler calls seem to be rising. So instead of being a flat up, down, up, down, up, down, they were actually up, downs where each peak was higher than the one before it. And we weren't sure if that reflects a difference in um, the age or sex of the birds at different times in the season or different populations that might have different flight calls. And finally, I'll play a bunting. So again, some kind of buzziness to it. Uh, and you might look at, think it looks kind of similar to the yellow warbler. It has substantially more peaks. Um, and if you get a really good recording, you can see it. It actually is kind of like two parallel versions of modulation, one lower one and one higher one. Um, but it'll typically be longer than a yellow warbler, and it'll typically have five to eight or even more peaks, whereas yellow warblers basically never have more than four peaks of this up and down call. Um, so this goes to show that it's actually easier visually to identify these than it is to hear them, really. Um, over the course of years of listening, I'm now pretty good. But Wilson's warblers took me a while to hear and really know. Um, but all of them I can recognize if I'm looking at a spectrogram, if I'm looking at the visual version of the sound, all of them I can recognize. Um, which brings us to what we actually did to monitor the birds. So what we needed to do is get recordings because we couldn't just rely on hearing. We need recordings that we can then um, analyze visually. So what we did to do this nocturnal migration study uh, was we got small recorders um, that have built-in microphones from a company called Wildlife Acoustics, which makes a lot of different audio recording equipment specifically for wildlife monitoring. We bought their cheapest and smallest equipment called the Song Meter Micro. So it's pretty small. Um, it takes three AAA batteries to power, and that's the bulk of the weight and size of it. So the battery pack is actually the biggest part of it. Um, the actual microphone setup is very, very small. The microphone is this little dot right here. These can be programmed. So we set them up to record from 30 minutes after sunset until 30 minutes before sunrise. Um, and by the time you get to 30 minutes before sunrise, there's lots of local birds singing and calling, and it gets much harder to tell what's an actual nocturnal migrant. Um, to keep these kind of safe, we mounted them in buckets, and then we put some mesh over the top to provide some protection from the sun um, or rain. It did actually rain once or twice, even in the spring season this particular year. And then one site, I actually mounted it uh, not in a bucket, not covered at all, but just bungeed directly to someone's rooftop TV antenna. Uh, just, we, we did a site in this, the town of Davis, um, paired with a sister site nearby just to see if we were picking up different things using the two different methods, the bucket versus the antenna. Um, we didn't seem to be getting particularly different magnitudes of birds with one method or the other. So where were our sites? Um, so it's not spanning that long of a distance, uh, but it's crossing some pretty different habitats. So what I'm calling our coast range sites uh, were recorders we put up at two different reserves, uh, both owned by the University of California. One is Quail Ridge, which is a private reserve uh, at the south end of Lake Berryessa. And the other is Stebbins Cold Canyon, which is a public reserve with very um, frequent hikers. Uh, and the reserve manager was very uh, pessimistic about our recorder getting stolen. Uh, but we put it back, we put it off trail uh, on a closed trail, which people still walk on sometimes. Uh, and we were fortunate enough that nobody nobody took it or and it interfered with our recorders over the course of the study. Um, then, as we transitioned to the middle of the Central Valley, uh, we had one site at another uh, private site owned by the University of California called Russell Ranch, um, which is used for agricultural experiments, but also for wildlife studies um, along a stretch of Puda Creek there. And then 
we had several urban sites at households in the town of Davis. Um, but we also wanted to make sure we had a dark and quiet site there. So we put one up in a, a preserve called South Fork Buda Creek Preserve, which is just on the southern end, south of the town of Davis. Um, because one thing that's known about bird calls at night is that birds call more um, in well-lit areas. And they'll call more um, when there's more background noise. So fireworks can actually trigger birds to start giving flight calls um, or a train horn honking uh, or a truck honking on a highway. Any of these can trigger birds to do some calling. So we wanted to make sure we didn't only have loud and bright sites um, as we got interior. We wanted to make sure we also had a dark and quiet site um, because we didn't want to be biased just by louder, brighter areas. So we had high hopes. I mean, we did this study. We actually had eight sites originally. Um, we had high hopes that we were going to be able to use software to automatically detect the birds and figure out and automatically categorize them to species. Uh, it didn't work out. It turns out that these small recorders, these song reader micros, um, they're relative, they're not directional en enough to um, have the birds calling overhead be loud enough above the background noise of everything else, of the frogs and crickets and highways and everything else we had in the background. So the automated methods, <clears throat> they don't work very well um, if the thing you're trying to detect is not loud compared to everything else, which meant that we ended up having to do this all by hand. So hundreds or up to thousands of hours of these recordings, just tabbing through, visually looking for those particular flight calls, uh, which is why it's taken us uh, a whole year to get to where we are. Um, I'm going to show you just a little bit of data from spring of 2022. So not this most recent spring, but the spring before, um, which is as far as we are with analyzing data, although I have since had a whole army of undergraduates also working on um, expanding the size of our sample, and we're just cleaning up that data now. Um, and you really do have to do it visually, because it'd be great if you could just put this on in the background while you're working. Uh, but there's a lot of background noise. So I'm going to play you kind of a typical recording from a place like Davis, uh, where in Davis, you're never too far from a highway. Uh, here is what's actually a very active period. Each of these little smudges on this spectrogram is a calling Swainson's thrush. Um, and let me play what this recording sounds like, though. So you can you can pick up the calls in there, but you can't sit listening to the, that level of highway noise to be able to hear the birds for um, hours at a time. So instead, this is entirely done visually um, with maybe some quick checks, double checking by listening when you have a call that might look somewhat ambiguous. So um, what did we find? I'm going to summarize. Um, we don't have much of a punchline because we're still pretty early in the data analysis, um, but I'll show you some of the most striking initial patterns we saw um, just really as food for thought. So here, um, in this slightly strange figure, uh, what this is called is a violin plot. And so this is trying to give you a sense of where the most common amount of um, some data is, as well as the spread of our data. And so here, um, we went through every night, and we quantified the hourly call rate. So on a big night, there might have been birds calling, 20 birds calling per hour. On a small night, there might have been less than one bird calling per hour, only a few birds recorded over a whole night. Um, and on many nights, there were no birds, um, or just, just one or two in a whole night. So what I'm showing you here is um, across all of our nights, um, what was the kind of hourly call rate? So number of calls per hour we saw. I took the square root just so this plot isn't biased by um, a couple of nights that were really, really high in their call rate that make it hard to visualize the rest of the data. But basically, the horizontal line in the middle of each of these violins, really they look like more like vases a lot of the time with real data. The horizontal line in the middle is the median, 
you can think about it as kind of like a typical night. So um, at Quail Ridge, our westernmost site, um, most nights had less than one call per hour. So square root of one is still one. So this is less than one call per hour. Kind of the best night had this square root of it is three, so about nine calls per hour. So even the best night, um, it's pretty quiet here. You might sit out there and um, be sipping a beer and um, only hear one bird the whole time you're sipping your drink. Um, at the sites as we move further east, Russell Ranch had a higher rate. Davis was uh, more than twice as high a rate of calling. Um, this is closer to three calls per hour. Um, and then the South Fork Poudre Creek was again a little quieter in part because it's not as bright and loud as Davis, um, but still substantially higher than Quail Ridge. And then to put this in a slightly more quantitative form, um, here I separated out by species. Um, SWTH stands for Swainson's Thrush. Weewa stands for Wilson's Warbler. Yiwa stands for Yellow Warbler. Lasby stands for Lazli Bunting. And then total included um, all of these calls and any other songbird call, even if we didn't identify it. Um, and what we found is that the total call rate on average was less than one bird per hour at Squail, Quail Ridge, which aligns with what we saw in the other data. Um, at Davis, it was actually 4.48 if we include all the other species that we didn't necessarily identify. Um, Swainson's thrushes were actually similarly abundant at all of the locations, but that was pretty much the only migrant we regularly heard at Quail Ridge. There were very few Wilson's warblers, yellow warblers, or Laz light buntings. Whereas at Russell Ranch, we actually had quite a few yellow warblers in particular. Um, in the town of Davis, we had um, not as many yellow warblers, but quite a few Wilson's warblers. At South Fork, we had mostly yellow warblers. So we had some differences here. Um, this is still a single season, and you know, one for one, um, yeah, you know, one year, one small set of just two months of recording. Um, because we didn't get all that many calls, um, things are generally pretty rare. Most nights we got no calls from any particular species. Um, it was hard to evaluate the actual timing of when the peak of any particular species was moving through. So basically for Swainson's thrushes, we didn't start to pick up any until May. I'm not showing the Davis site here because the recorder had malfunctioned and we lost part of the season. So we lost kind of the end of May. Um, but then we sporadically had big nights, um, but not in a way that produced a particular obvious peak of when the Swainson's thrushes were moving. Wilson's warblers, um, the only site where they were really abundant was at Russell Ranch. And there actually was a particularly big night just after May 15th. So it's interesting um, from a birder's perspective, this might feel like it's a little bit later than when you think about the birds moving, um, but there are still lots of young and female birds moving at this time that might be pretty hard to detect in the daytime. Um, we, might, we might also be putting in less effort in the field by the time we get to May 15th as it starts to get pretty warm. Um, and these females and young birds aren't singing as much, so they're not going to be as easy or maybe as fun to go out and watch. Uh, for yellow warblers, um, it seemed to be a pretty clear tail off. We got essentially no calls at any site by the end of May. Um, we had a strong peak around the middle of May, um, from May 15th around until May 22nd. And then last light buntings were actually so rare, we were surprised how hard it was to detect them. Um, maybe it's just because birds call so rarely, um, then these are not nearly um, as large northern populations north of us as there are for the other species we looked at, where, I mean, yellow warblers, there's millions of them breeding farther north. Um, whereas lazuli buntings, that might not be the case, that the breeding range is not nearly as expansive into the far north where there's so much land and such large populations. Um, and then one final fun thing, uh, we looked at what time of night we picked up the calls. And this is something that we didn't discover 
Um, it's but something that's been known that oftentimes you'll hear big groups of thrushes moving in the in the hours before dawn. But what, what we found is exactly that. We actually basically didn't pick up any flight calls of swings and thrushes in the first half of the night. So the way I'm going to represent this data, it's kind of like a 24-hour clock with midnight at the top, 6 a.m. At the, at the right side, 6 p.m. at the left side. Um, and so the length of any wedge tells you the relative amount of calls heard at that time of day. So here, there's essentially no birds heard between sunset and midnight. And then as we get closer and closer to around 4 a.m., um, the number of swings and thrushes detected on our recorders went up. And then um, basically, this is roughly sunrise. So by the time we got to late May, the sun was rising at five something. So um, that's when our recorder stopped. So swings and thrushes showed a very clear pattern. The other species, not so much. Wilson's warblers, um, actually the most were detected before midnight uh, in the hours between nine and midnight. Um, although it's unclear if that's statistically uh, meaningful. I mean, we don't have all that many calls. Um, similarly, yellow warblers heard throughout the night um, with maybe a peak somewhere roughly near midnight. Lazuli buntings, we got so few calls um, that I wouldn't read too much into the differences here. But if you want to ever hear Swainson's thrushes migrating, um, wake up an hour before sunrise, uh, sit outside with some tea or coffee on some night between May 10th and May 25th. Mm -hmm. And you might just be lucky enough to hear some whole group of birds lowering down and giving those little creep calls, which can be really magical to hear. Um, so we had focused on these particular species, which uh, we knew we'd be able to identify. And then there's a lot we didn't know what we'd find. So uh, one thing we had on our minds, however, was that we might be pretty good at detecting water birds. And um, there's some interesting questions related to water birds moving through the Central Valley. You know, for example, there are some, some shorebirds like uh, the Western subspecies of Willet, which, well, they winter on the coast and they breed in the interior west of the United States and Canada, but they're so hard to detect in the Central Valley. Um, we get such small numbers of them passing through. You can go a whole spring without anybody seeing one. And we were wondering, well, what's going on um, is that just because they can migrate through the area in one night? They never have any reason to stop over and forage in the Central Valley? Um, and if so, will we hear, hear any of them? Because shorebirds are often pretty vocal, giving nocturnal flight calls. Uh, and indeed, we did hear willets twice. So um, we heard them in both over the town of Davis. And I've actually heard them at my house since then a few times. Um, and we heard them at Russell Ranch, so kind of between Davis and the coast ranges. Um, and then we heard a lot of other water birds too. So we heard many shorebirds. I highlighted other shorebirds in green um, throughout the season and at all of our sites. Uh, we heard rails highlighted in yellow uh, at three of our sites, including both Sora, Virginia Rail, and Common Gallinule. Uh, we heard geese a lot, mostly greater right fronted geese. Um, but since we reviewed more data since this, we've also found flocks of cackling geese, flocks of snow geese, um, maybe a tundra swan here or there, and um, some herons, particularly black crowned night heron, uh, which are known from the east to give frequent nocturnal flight calls, and then some assortment of ducks here and there giving calls. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. Uh, not quite enough. The data is very, very sparse, so not enough to do much with statistically, uh, but interesting to think about um, and interesting to imagine kind of paired with other forms of data people have with measuring and monitoring shorebirds moving through. So um, that's the pilot analysis of some of our early data. We actually have a lot more data we're working with. So we have a few other sites that we've since 
almost completed analyzing. Uh, we also have a whole other season. So we have a fall season as well um, for all of the sites that we discussed today. Um, and what Cameron and I did over this summer and are almost finished um, is to pick a few of the nights that were the biggest nights. So the nights where there were hundreds of birds calling, um, those, those high call rate nights, and to try to figure out everything passing by. So to get a snapshot of the kind of birds moving through in the early season, the kind of birds moving through around the start of May, and the kind of birds moving through around the end of May. Uh, and so we're in that process now. There's lots of mysteries. We're still figuring out. We might have 10 calls that all have a very particular shape in their spectrogram, um, but something that's we either we don't know or that is not in um, the databases that are, are largely biased towards the East Coast. So much of the studies of nocturnal flight, my, nocturnal flight calls and migration are focused on eastern eastern birds in the U.S. Um, so we've been trying to figure out more of the flight calls of western birds um, and get good recordings of them. To do that, I've actually been working with a team of undergrads um, to go up to places where there's active migration in the early morning. So there's a site west of Vacaville. Um, along Blue Ridge, where you can actually see groups of warblers, tanagers, and so on migrating over in the early morning. And sure enough, they give the flight calls um, that sound effectively identical to the flight calls they give at night. They give those flight calls in the morning as well as they're flying over. And we've been out there with shotgun microphones recording them, with some people helping to identify them, with other people trying to record them. It's a messy process. We have lots of data. Uh, we're just working through it now. Um, and that's where we are with it. So I'd like to thank, we had a lot of help from um, support and funders, including the Yolo Audubon Society um, and the Swift family, a lot of help from the Museum of Wildlife and Fish Biology at UC Davis, and then a lot of help from property owners and property managers who helped us get access to the places to store our recorders. And then um, since the initial round of data collection that was led by Cameron, I've had a whole army of awesome undergraduates, including Jasmine Aguilar, Jess Baggett, Stephanie Botcher, Jay Chen, Frank Fabro, Ashley McNeil, Laura Morris, Zane Pickus, Alan Robbins, Justin Saldana, Finn Velasaris, and Angela Yang. Um, and one of those students, Jay, made this amazing logo. Um, we call ourselves the Night Flight Crew with, with the acronym NFC. And um, since have done a lot of great work working through these data, and I'm really excited to, um, for us to get it together and maybe present again in a future year. So we can stop here. Thanks everyone for joining and I'd love to discuss whatever questions you have. Thank you so much, Rob. That was really fascinating. Uh, please put your questions in the chat box and Rob will attempt to answer them. In the meantime, I wanna remind anybody who came in late to please uh, send your membership dues in. This is the new season. And to go to our website, fresnoaudubon.org, to check out the field trips that are coming up in the next uh, couple of weeks. Any questions? I think Rob really covered the topic very well. Okay, here we go. Aaron has a question for you there. Is there any work with something like haiku box to track nocturnal movement? Um, what is haiku box? Uh, Aaron, we can we can unmute you if you'd like to say. Yeah, this is Aaron. It's basically like a automatic and continuous like bird song identification tool that basically is like a microphone but it's supposedly you like put it in your home and then it monitors the sounds of birds through them whenever 24 7. Mm -hmm. yeah people are working on that they're they're working on a specific one for nocturnal flight calls it's not quite ready for prime time it's pretty much ready on the east coast actually um but most of the models for detecting flight calls and, and categorizing them to species have not been trained on all that much Western data. So things don't work as well. Like it's still unclear the extent to which we can separate 
doesn't seem like we can separate Townsend's and Hermit Warblers. Um, from our data, it seems like maybe you can separate black footed Gray Warbler, um, but the automatic detectors don't work all that well yet. I've been talking with some of the people who, um, who make them to try to share some of our um, validated data that we got with our shotgun microphones at the morning flight site to try to improve some of those models, to try to have them build models specifically tailored to California. Um, but basically, the, the but yeah, I think we're not that far off from having that work for nocturnal flight calls too. Okay, any other questions? I see a question here. Beyond individual calls, did you extrapolate them to total numbers migrating? Um, so we're we're missing one step there. We want to do that. Um, the problem is that what you hear, there's a black box in between what you hear. Um, and how many birds are actually moving because the conditions determine how much birds call. It's not like every night it's always 10% of birds call as they pass over or something. Some night it might be that there's lots of birds all giving calls. Some night there might be still be lots of birds moving, but they're mostly quiet. Um, so what people usually do is they build, um, there's some pretty good studies of what are the right um, weather variables to use to predict when birds are gonna call more or less. Um, has to do mainly with cloud cover and the height of the, um, the height of the cloud mass, um, the altitude of it, and um, the, the wind speed and things like that. And so uh, we're hoping that we can build that model too, and then use that to get closer to modeling actual, doing actual comparisons of the relative amount of birds moving at different sites. But we'll never have like a raw number to say like, oh, um, well, we actually do have it from BirdCast. BirdCast tells you they estimate 270,000 birds passed over last night. So we actually do have those for every night. Um, and we're going to incorporate that into the model too to see the extent to which what we pick up is aligned with the actual magnitude of birds moving. And then that might tell us roughly, well, how many of those birds are yellow warblers? and so on. Great. Okay, anybody else? Last chance for questions. Yes, BirdCast is done entirely by radar. Um, that's just radar-based for now. Although they're working on some things that might incorporate flight call recorders too. 